morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to thank everybody for being with us here this morning. Welcome to our Sage Action Leadership Lecture Series program. I'm Mark Faulkner, President of Dunwoody College of Technology Alumni Association. This lecture series was created by the Alumni Board of Managers and featured keynote speakers on the topic of leadership the first Thursday of every month. <coughs> It's my pleasure today to introduce Judy Profil, Senior Vice President, Corporate Secretary and Executive Services for XL Energy. XL Energy, as you know, is one of the nation's largest energy companies and is headquartered in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis. <laughs> Judy joined XL Energy in 1998, has held a variety of leadership roles within the company. Previously, she held leadership roles at the Minnesota Division of Energy Resources and Santa Point Energy, where she managed state, federal, <coughs> regulatory activities. Also, she has more than 30 years of energy industry experience. Judy's an active community leader. She currently serves on the board of the Greater Twin Cities United Way, the College of St. Benedict, and the Science Museum of Minnesota. She is also a member of the Minnesota Women's Economic Roundtable. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Government from the College of St. Benedict and a Master of Arts degree in Public Affairs from the University of Minnesota's Hubert H. Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs. Please welcome, or please join me in welcoming Judy. Can everybody hear me if I just speak like this? Go ahead, Scott, because. If you make me nervous, I'll go back behind here. Okay, <laughs> but otherwise we'll just we'll just we'll just be friends here this morning. So, how many of you now are alums? All of you are alums. Most of you are alums. Are any students? Okay, students got let out. I bet they're they're home free. Well, um, so you know, congratulations to all of you for for actually being here. Kudos to you. You know, one of the things my boss always says is, um, you know, always place a bet on yourself. Always bet on yourself, and um, you by being here and taking active interest in your career, or wanting to learn something new, or networking and staying connected with your school, is telling me you place that bet. And so, congratulations for that. I will try to make my time here um, that you, when you walk away, that you'll think that it was worthwhile. I wanted to talk about leadership, not about energy in particular. I'll try to make sure we have enough time to have, answer questions around energy because I expect a number of you may have those. Um, but the topic of this lecture series is leadership, and um, I think it's really something useful to sit back and reflect upon, because one of the things I think about leaders is that they are great students of history, and in particular of their own. And they think about the lessons they've learned and they apply it as they go forward and they continue to work and to grow. And so my premise of this whole conversation is that for leadership, I think it's really an inside job. It involves inside work. Uh, the beauty about that is that you can do it. Uh, the challenge about that is that you're the only one who can do it. You're the only one who can do that for you. And so while I think it's great to go um, you know, read about leadership, take classes, learn things, get all the trappings of it, that, those things are things that can go into your toolbox. But the real work is inside work. Okay? So what I'm going to do is share um, a story or two about my own inside work. Um, I believe in the power of stories. Um, you know, the great thing about hearing a story, think about when you hear something on the radio, or uh, you know, someone tells you something funny, and, and you, you, really, you can really relate to it, you really like it, you get kind of jazzed up, and you want to go tell someone, right? And so later, you go try to tell someone that story. And what happens? You get it all messed up. Right? You go try to tell the story, and then it's like, you get going, then you kind of get ahead, and you say, wait, what happened first? Wait, uh, well, oh, uh, well, never mind that. And, and you go and you tell, but what is the thing, what you want to share is how it made you feel, or what it made you think about. The details of the story really don't matter. What engaged you was how it applied to you. So I'm going to tell you a story or two from my own leadership stories, um, and you might get a chuckle out of it. You might be able to relate to it. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what my question back to you is going to be, these were mine, what's yours? 
what's yours? Because I think it's worth spending some time about, thinking about. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to take you back. We're on the college campus. I'm going to take you back when I was. Okay, back at back at school, I um, I ended up being a student at government, but I was the type of person who uh, changed majors um, really fast. <laughs> okay, I had a lot of interests. Um, the world excited me, and I was not sure what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. And so I had the bright idea that I would take all of these upper division classes. Right, um, I, that's where the interesting stuff is. So I'll take all these upper division classes, then I'll pick my major. And then I'll go back and pick up all those pesky prerequisites because, you know, they're boring. Um, but I'll go do those so I can get my major, right? I do not advise the path I took. I'm simply <laughs> reporting what I did. Okay. Somehow I skirted under the radar screen of academic advising. Um, so I am uh, fall of my sophomore year. And I'm enrolled in a class called the Congress. And it was a class taught seminar style, which I really liked. So I'm, I'm, it's a class where you know all you do is read the original mm -hmm. work. Um, you come in prepared to debate and discuss it in class. You maybe wrote a paper at the end, but your grade was mostly based on <coughs> your ability to read, put together a cogent argument, and defend it in classroom discussion. Okay? So first day of class, I go clicking down the halls of a 150-year-old building, right? And I walk into this classroom, and there are all the chairs sitting around in a circle. There's about 10, 12, okay? And it did not take me long to surmise that, number one, I was the only sophomore, and number two, I was the only woman, okay? And to describe these senior young men as senior young men is I just want to paint the scene as to what they were like, okay? Uh, they, they were more like um, just picture an open field filled with, like, young bucks, okay? <laughs> they had, like, antlers, and they liked to clash with each other, right, verbally. I mean, this is what they were. They were, they were all ready to take the LSAT. They were all going to go out in the world, go to law school, and then go out and sue people. You know, I mean, they were bold and brassy and everything that I was not. So that's the setting. So get my first assignment, go home and read it, come back to class the next day. The discussion starts. And I'm sitting there going, huh. I have no idea how what I read relates to what these guys are talking about. I better read it again. So class over, I go home, I read the first assignment again. I read the second assignment. I come back, same thing happens. Now, about this time, I start to rethink my position on prerequisites, right? Because I'm thinking, maybe had I taken these other classes, I would have gotten a decoder ring that helped me understand how what I read related to what these guys are saying. But right now, I'm not getting it, okay? So I'm in a pickle. I'm in a real pickle because my grades can be based on my ability to argue and to discuss, right? So what do I start doing? I started watching the room real carefully. And I pick out a couple of people who I thought were the most, I could relate the most to what they said. They seemed the most normal. And so when they talked, I would jump in and add the punctuation. You know? They'd say something and I'd go, oh, just take it a little here, oh, take it a little there. Now, you know, this went on for a while and I thought, you know, hey. I'm starting to get the hang of it. I, I can do this. I got this. I got this. Okay? So I'm going along. And this went on for quite some time until one day when I found myself in a head-on debate with one of the bucks. And in fact, it was like the top buck. Okay? So I said something. And he went, Burr. And I don't know what got into me that day, but I said, uh-uh, you know, and uh, Okay, now, point of the story. I believe that in this world we can divide ourselves into fight animals or flight animals. I am a flight animal. So at this point, all my flight animal instincts start kicking in, right? My heart starts pounding and my palms start sweating and my voice starts kind of wavering and my foot starts thumping. If he is the big bug, I'm the little thumper bunny, you know, <laughs> holding her own. Shock of shock, holding her own. 
but I'm quite sure that someone's going to die on this exchange. <laughs> but I hung in there. And what I think was obvious to the teacher from day one became obvious to everyone else in the class as this discussion went on, and eventually became obvious to even me, was that this guy had no idea what he was talking about. And in fact, in the very last exchange, it became clear he had not even read the work. Okay? So picture this, the big buck in the corner, by the little thumper bunny. Okay? <laughs> That's what happened. No one was more shocked than I. First of all, because I'm thinking, heck, I've read this stuff about four times by now. <laughs> Reading it's an option, you know? <laughs> I'm stunned. But so you know how when there's an argument and, and then people start talk, stop talking and it feels like there's some energy in the air just kind of still there. Everyone's waiting for like what's going to happen next. That's what was going on in this room. We're all just, whoa. What happens next? Is that the guy pushes himself back in his chair, glares at me, and mutters under his breath just loud enough for everyone to hear dumb female dog that rhymes with bridge. <laughs> Bell ring, class over. Okay. Well, there's a lot of things one could take away from an exchange like that. Let me tell you mine. Never, ever undervalue the worth of your own co contribution. Okay? Never, ever under or devalue the worth of your own contribution. You know, I was going to class, but I was not doing my job. I was taking up space, but I did not occupy my chair. My job was to go in and say what I thought, and I did not do that. And I think I was just so, I felt so different than everyone there that I was not going <coughs> to go out on it and sound different from them, too. So I kind of went along. I went along and just kind of got by. But my job had been to go in and say what I thought. And I think, you know, I was so concerned about looking different, sounding different, <coughs> being different, um, that I wasn't going to speak up because, God forbid, I knew I didn't have the experience these guys did. I knew I didn't have the class stuff that they had. I just assumed I didn't know. So I just kind of played it safe. But truth be told, what I was so afraid of is that I might say something that made me sound dumb. And you know what was really, really underneath that was one of those fears that kind of, you know, only surfaces in the deepest, darkest times, where actually I thought that somewhere, somehow, someday, someone was going to figure out that I was not as smart as everyone thought I was. That's what I mean about inside work. That's what I mean about that. Because we can all talk about how, you know, you know, things should be obviously facilitate everyone, be a safe place for people to talk, encourage people to speak up, all of that. I don't want to take anything away from that. But I gotta tell you, unless and until I came to believe in the worth of my own contribution, all of that stuff was only gonna make a marginal difference. I had to buy it. Because for God's sakes, if I didn't buy it, why should anyone else? Why should anyone else? Okay? So that's what I mean. This is inside work. This is inside work, and this was some of mine. Now let me tell you how I've seen this play out over the course of over the course of my career. You know, I have managed people who put out a lot of um, a lot of paper, a lot of stuff that has to be accurate, precise, correct. Um, and every now and then, boy, something slips by. Something gets by and, you know, it's just plain wrong. And we'll go do the debrief, like, how did this happen? You know, how did this happen? And invariably, invariably, someone will say, you know, I saw that and I didn't think that looked right. But I didn't say anything because everyone else seemed so sure. Okay? That's not occupying your chair. That's not occupying your chair. And that's spoken by someone who did not believe in the value of their own contribution. <laughs> Let me take it up to later, you know, in your career. When you're there in, you know, management meetings, you're making decisions, you're faced with lots of problems. And somewhere, you know, you've all probably been in meetings like this. Somewhere in the course of the meeting, 
Someone gets a great idea, and everyone starts rallying around, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's what we'll do. We're going to hop on this train and head on over to the promised land, and all our problems will be solved, right? It like takes over, and you're there thinking, well, that's great, but in between here and the promised land is a great big old cliff that we're going to go over to our fiery do, you know, before we get there. Are you going to say it? You know, are you going to stand up and say it? Are you going to do it if the idea is your boss's idea? Are you going to do it if the idea is your boss's boss's idea? Because I'll tell you, a leader would. A leader would. And I'm not saying that they, you know, like, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard. You know, you got to have your savvy. But you certainly can say, hey, before we embark, I think we need to think through what we do about X when Y happens, because that's what I see. And I think we should know the answer to that before we go. Right? That's leadership. Doesn't matter how many people you got. Doesn't matter the size of your organization. That's leadership. And that's more and more what we require, I think, in the business world today. Okay? Let me tell you a little, a little bit more about, about my story. Just, just to, to put a little end to it. You know, that exchange with that other student um, uh, that threw me for a loop. It says more about where I was at the time of my life than, than him. But it threw me for a loop. So, so you know, I'm going around, blah, 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 blah. You know, all my friends are all, yeah, yeah, what a jerk. You know, we're all kind of <laughs> reinforcing that. If that event happened on a Tuesday, it's Friday night, it's Friday about 6.30. I'm in my advisor's office. Picture this, it's a government, a government teacher. He's in some little hovel of an office. It's overflowing with books. He's got papers everywhere. He's got his feet up on his desk. He's got a cigarette in one hand and a scotch in the other, okay? That's my, bless his soul, uh, my advisor. And I'm in there going, blah, blah, blah. You know, who does he think he is? Blah, blah, blah. You know, does he think I'm dumb? You know, blah, blah, blah. Going, going on and on. And I remember this so well. My advisor takes a drag off his cigarette. And he just stares at me and he says, you know what, Forstner? I mean, you know what, Forstner? Nobody thinks about you as much as you think they do. And nobody thinks about you as much as you think about them. Okay, now I didn't know whether I should be insulted or relieved, but I will tell you this. Those words struck me like a ton of bricks. It was like in here. I do believe that we're all here on this earth to learn something, and this is one of the things that I think I'm here to learn. All right. It was a truth that I did not know what it meant. I did not know what I thought about it, but I thought, pay attention. Pay attention because this is important. And I can tell you how that's played out throughout my life. And I'll tell you, that has been one of my life lessons to learn, to let that go and to just do what I needed to do. But this moral of that part of the story is to talk to you about mentorship. You know, people talk about getting mentors and the need to get, you know, you know, have regular coffee dates, and the need to pick someone who has a career like you, or look have a life that looks like you, um, whatever, and, and that, that, and I don't want to, again, take anything away from that. But I want to stress for you that mentors are everywhere. Mentors are all around you. You can get mentored by just asking someone, how'd you do that? Why did you do that? You know how we all watch people who are, they're in a meeting that you, um, you know, man, they, you think something's going down, and then, wow, they saved it somehow, snatched, snatched it out and saved the idea. Go ask them how they did it, why they did it, how they prepared. That's mentoring. Because I'll tell you, I got some of the best mentoring of my life when I was 19 years old from, like, a 50-year-old guy with a scotch and a in hand. <laughs> right? It's all around us. It's do we listen, do we apply it, how do we use it? Okay? Okay. So I've got lots of other stories, but what I think I'll do is I'll hit on some of the things that are my key lessons uh, that I have learned um, as I've gone through my career, and, um, um, and then we can open up for questions. Um, you know, one of the key lessons I have learned is when you go into something, really know and own your own objective. Know and own your own objectives. You need this goes with that occupy your chair, 
right? Know what you want to do. When I first stepped into a really major leadership role, and um, I'll tell you, I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, at the Hobbit <coughs> Company, there's an open, important position, and everyone, you know, there's the running bet as to who's going to get it. I was not the bet, and, uh, you know, I did. And when I first stepped into that role, I, you wouldn't believe how many people would, would, would stop you and say, oh, well, congratulations, you know, when are you going to reorganize? Congratulations, you can fire me. Congratulations, you know, when are you going to shake things up and reorganize? And I'm sitting there going, you know, I did not inherit a group that needed reorganization in my view at all. I had other things I wanted to accomplish. But when you're feeling a little unsteady and not exactly sure of what you want to do, those kinds of things can pull and sway you. So I finally asked people, why, why do you think I should be organized? And they said at the time the title I had was a CEO, and it was, well, because that's what CEOs do. You go in and you mark your territory. Okay? Is that a good reason to go reorganize? I don't think so. So fortunately, I was clear enough on my own objectives to go, I'm saving the marking territory when I walk my dogs, you know? I'm going to go accomplish what I want to accomplish. But if you're not clear on what you want to do, you can be so influenced by what you hear. And again, your job is to occupy your chair. If they give you the chair, do what you think you should with it. Use that opportunity to do what you should with it. Okay? Another lesson I've learned along the way. Give yourself permission. Give yourself permission. You're your own toughest critic. Okay? We can be so hard on ourselves. Right? There was there was a while as I was going through my career, I had um, separated from my husband. I had a child in preschool. I had a high stress job, and we were going through a um, merger, um, the, the merger that actually formed Excel. And uh, my role was to gain regulatory approval um, here in the upper Midwest. And if you want to feel like, you know, you've got like the weight of the company, you know, on your shoulders, be accountable for getting the merger approved, right? I did. So high stress job, um, you know, uh, newly separated, not family for support um, around here. And so, you know, that, that was my life. How did I do it? Um, because I, I did not want to miss the career thing. This was a chance to do something that I thought was important and valuable. But boy, oh boy, at that stage of my life, I also knew I was not going to get a chance to be a mom. Not happening. And I was not going to miss that either. So how did I arrange my day? You know? All right. I get the kid up. We have breakfast. I take him to school, drop him off. Actually, often talk to the teacher a little bit because <laughs> okay, you know, so big plus got bring donuts. Um, so, uh, you know, so it's always, it always helps. And so, um, um, draw quite my way through traffic, get to work, have an extremely full day at work. Um, you know, running day all the way through, oh geez, five o'clock, gotta fight my way back through traffic to pick up the child. Um, go out to eat because, you know, it's all, you know, Actually, teaching your kid restaurant skills is a good place. <laughs> Much more so than what my cooking could have ever done for the child. So, um, you know, eat out, play games, read stories. If he's in bed by 8.30, I'm asleep by 8.31 because I'm exhausted. But the alarm goes off at 3 a.m. And I get up, pull up my laptop, pick up all the work that happened before you know, overnight, moved to the lawn, worked until about six, hopped in the shower, went and did it again. That was my day, okay? I wouldn't trade it for anything. I got to do my two best things. <coughs> and it was the way I could do it. But what was my issue? I'll tell you, when I had to walk out the door at 4.30 or 5, I felt kind of guilty. Mm -hmm. I felt kind of guilty, right? And I felt like everyone's kind of looking at me thinking, what a slacker. Never mind that I put in more hours before they even woke up, right, than most of them <laughs> might have done. Um, give yourself permission. It was the way I could do it. <coughs> it was the only way I could do it. And I look back at that with such pride because I got to do, again, my two best things. And if I have any wish for, you, for, for my wish for all of you is that you get to do your best things, you know, Give yourself permission to do that. The 
The last point I'll just mention is going to having a sense of timing. I think leaders have a great sense of timing. And I'll say this because, especially as I watch people come up in their careers, they want to do things so fast. They want things fast, they want to achieve things fast, they put so much pressure on them to go fast, go do things. And sometimes that can mean go act. If something happened, go act. Well, actually, you know what you're doing is you're reacting. You're not acting, you're reacting. Often, as I have worked in um, this, this whole regulatory space that I did, something would happen in a, in a proceeding where, you know, it's, it's something happened and the push would be, we got to jump, we got to go react, right? And one of the most powerful things I would always do is just go, no, we're just going to sit down. We're going to sit on our hands for a minute and watch what happens next. And I can tell you that I never, ever have regretted slowing something down to give us time to think. I have regretted jumping in too fast, because you can't undo what you did. So having a sense of timing and having the confidence as the leader to say, you know what, let's sit on this a bit. Incredibly powerful thing. And you watch that go through you know, your, whole, your whole group and they just go, oh, okay. Okay. Again, that comes from you knowing what you want to do, fully occupying the chair, giving yourself permission to do it the way you want to do it, and leading. And leading. Okay, so those are some of my stories and some of my lessons. What I want to leave you with today is think about your own. To the extent that you can relate to them, that's great. That's great. But if you can't, the issue is you've got your own. You've got your own inside work to be done. You've got your own stories that you draw from. Think about that. And then for you, those of you who are at the later stages of your career, what I would just so recommend, share them. Just share them. People want to be led by people who are authentic, and by people they know and that they can relate to. And sometimes I think we get so busy thinking of what's the image, or what's this leadership image that we forget about. Let us all know who we are as people. Let us know who we are as people. That's the best way I think to lead a team. People want to know that they're alive. Okay. So that's the end of my remarks. That's the stories that I wanted to share. We didn't talk about energy. We certainly <laughs> can. We certainly can. Uh, but with that, I'll open up to questions. Any questions out there? One more story. One more story. One more story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay. I'll tell you one. I'll tell you a quick one. Are you, are you sure? Any yeah, others? Yeah. Oh, one, another story? Okay. All right. Let's go way back. All right, this goes to how I learned about knowing your own objectives. Let's see if I can remember how to tell this one. So this goes back to when, um, actually, I was growing up and I was a babysitter. Okay? So everyone's kind of looking, where's she going? I was a babysitter. So I was the second of five kids. Um, and I uh, was just the way our ages fell because we had some spread out kids. I was like in eighth grade. I still had a, a couple of, um, I don't know, second, third grade, and then a baby sister, my baby sister. And uh, my older sister was off doing things, so I was off in the, the babysitter. And uh, when I was, my objectives were very clear. Um, it was, don't lose one. <laughs> don't let anyone get maimed or injured. Start dinner. And if you can, if you have time, dust and back into the living room. Because when my mom came home and could smell that lemon pledge and see the lines <laughs> in the shade carpet, she could go, oh, you know, I can do this, right? I can so that was my objective. Now, um, all would seem like that was going really pretty well. I'm the officer in charge, right? I can manage this, except for my baby sister. Now, Sarah was, <laughs> Sarah was like the largest, roundest baby you ever did see. You know, we actually, we actually thought that maybe something was wrong with her because she never did learn to crawl. You know, she knew, cause she just couldn't push herself up to crawl. But it didn't really matter. She took forever to walk. It didn't really matter because what she could do was roll wherever she wanted to go, wherever she wanted to go. So she'd go rolling, and invariably she would get stuck underneath the dining room table. 
got caught up in all the chairs and all this stuff. She'd be stuck there. So I'm the officer in charge. What do I need to do? I go and I unstick the baby, right? I put her out, set her down. She starts rolling. All the other kids are, you know, racing around this track that we had with their big wheels and all this stuff, you know, running into the baby, all this stuff. She's rolling around. Oh, she gets stuck again. Oops, I got to get her out again. This is all going on. I, I, can't, I can't get anything done, right? I can't get anything done. Dinner's not started. The, the, the pledge is not, the pledge is still in the cupboard, you know, not happening, right? Now, I don't know if this, if this occurred to me on my own or if somebody told me this, but it, it eventually it came to me that, that my problem was the stuck baby, you know, and, and not really the stuck baby, but my propensity to unstick her, right? Because when she was <laughs> under there, she didn't cry and fuss. She sat there and played with her toes and sang a song. If, she, if you talk to her now, she said, I had to get away from all the commotion. You know, I just went under the table. But I took her out because, I don't know, I thought that I was in charge of, it would be wrong if the baby's just stuck into there, right? <laughs> what was I doing? She was not the one getting in the way of me getting done what I needed to get done. I was. Because I was less clear on my own objectives. When she was under there, go cook dinner. When she was under there, go do whatever. She was happy as a clam. So the number one lesson in executive leadership to learn is, just let those stuck things lie, you know? <laughs> just leave them alone. If they aren't helpful for you to accomplish your objectives, you know, think about it. I was supposed to don't lose one. There she is. <laughs> don't let her get maimed and injured. She's fine, you know? Start dinner. I got a chance. Vacuum, I got a chance. When she was there, she was my high-performing team member when she was stuck under the table, <laughs> right? <laughs> the rest of them were more the problem. But what was I doing? I'm sticking her. Why? Why? So that goes to, again, know your own objectives and don't get in the way of your own objectives. And you know what mostly gets us in the way of our own objectives? It's kind of like our own foibles, right? I'm a lover of the written word. I love the written word. I love a beautifully constructed sentence. I do. Do you know how many pieces of paper cross my desk or my screen that do not have beautifully constructed sentences? <laughs> Most, right? <laughs> if I am not careful, what am I prone to do, especially if something's going to be coming up for me? I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it the most perfect article, announcement, whatever, because that's my foible, right? <coughs> you know, they pay me to help lead a company, not to just have perfect knowledge, right? <laughs> Don't get in the way of your own objectives. And recognize it's some of the things that you just love the most. And frankly, some of the things that probably got you to where you are can be exactly those things that get in the way.